Okay, everyone, I think we might get started. Um, lovely to see you all here, um, despite the downpour outside. Um, my name's Elizabeth Wilson. I'm the chair of the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and I'm just going to um, kick proceedings off tonight by saying a few words about Jessica Glaser. Um, but before I do that, I want to just um, thank some of the people, while I've got the microphone, um, who have been at the core of organising this event on the departmental side. Um, and in particular, I want to say thank you to uh, Chanel Craft, the Assistant Director of the Centre for Women. Um, and to Tia Williams, who is the undergraduate convener. Um, and they did most of the heavy lifting um, on our side, so thank you so much. It's been really um, superb work, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to have us here um, for this new event. Um, I also want to thank uh, Beth Reingold, who's coming to speak after me. Beth is the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the department, um, and she oversaw many of the changes that um, have taken place and how this lecture has been um, organised. Beth steps down as the Director of Undergraduate Studies at the end of the semester, and I'd like to publicly thank her for all of the work she's done for the undergraduate curriculum over the last two and a half years. So let me um, just say a few words about Jessica Glaser, uh, in whose name this endowed lecture um, has been uh, set. Jessica Glaser majored, majored in women's studies and political science here at Emory. She was a very engaged student. In particular, she was uh, passionate about issues of social justice. For example, in order to do her research, the research for her honours thesis, Jessica became a, ca a caseworker at the DeKalb County Department of Family and Children's Services. She graduated under the supervision of Beth Reingold with high honours. Jessica was uh, also a committed member of the broader Emory community. She was a student representative um, inside the department uh, on the undergraduate curriculum committee, but she was also president of the Political Science Honour Society. She was an active member of Emory's Pre-Law Society, Emory's NAACP chapter, and the Alpha Epsilon Phi sorority. She was also the editorials editor of the Emory Wheel. So Jessica graduated from Emory uh, 20 years ago this year, um, in May of 1996. On her way to law school that year in the fall, she was killed in a car accident. As a way of memorialising Jessica's political attachments, her family and her friends provided the funds whereby the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the Centre for Women at Emory could offer an annual lecture in her name. So over the years, we have tried hard to honour Jessica by bringing to campus the kind of women Jessica might have wanted to become or the kind of women that she simply <coughs> admired. In previous years, Jessica Glace, the, Glace, the Jessica Glaser Lecture has been given by the poets Natasha Trethaway and Rita Dove. And the speakers have included the journalist uh, Helen Thomas and the activists uh, Zainab Selby and Danielle Henderson. So we are delighted this year to be able to add Janetta Elzey and Monica Ray Simpson to that roll call. So I'm going to pass proceedings over now to Beth, who's going to talk about the Praxis Group that has helped put this group together. <coughs> Thank you and welcome. It's great to see everyone here. Now, from the very beginning, the Jessica Glasser Lecture uh, has been designed for undergraduate students in particular. But for this year, the 20th anniversary, uh, as Elizabeth alluded, we decided to do things differently. In keeping with the original vision and with Jessica's own campus activism and service, the Jessica Glasser Lecture is now designed not only for students, but also by students. About this time last year, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department and the Center for Women at Emory issued a call for nominations for what was then called the CWE WGSS Student Advisory Council and is now called the Praxis. The Council, now Praxis Mission, was and still is to build bridges between theory and practice by providing firsthand accounts of student needs and ideas giving advice and implementing strategies on programming of interest to young women and girls, building relationships with faculty and staff, and leading campus events that promote gender equity. The Jessica Glasser Lecture is at the top of that long list. 
Long story short, we received 37 nominations from all over campus, from which eight outstanding students were selected to join the Praxis. And these students didn't just help make the 2016 Jessica Glasser lecture happen, they made it from scratch. They chose the themes, identified and recruited our guest speakers, designed the format, and took charge of promoting the event. Nothing you are about to see, hear, or feel would have occurred without their diligent, creative, hard work. So please join me in recognizing the members of the Praxis who I hope uh, will rise and stay standing when I call their names. Alexa Kakopoulos, <laughs> Janelle Elder, <laughs> Jocelyn Hong, Jasmine Huffman, Chelsea Jackson, Giovanna Jones, <laughs> Jasmine McKell, and Kimberly Cote, who I know can't be here because she's in, she's in Spain studying abroad. Uh, thank you all so much for all your work. <laughs> I'd like also to recognize and thank the two people who have guided and inspired the Praxis for this past year with large doses of wisdom, energy, skill, and time. You've already met them, but they are, again, Tia Williams, undergraduate, WGSS Undergraduate Program Coordinator, and Chanel Craft Tanner, Assistant Director. Assistant Director of the Center for Women and WGSS PhD candidate. Thank you again. So before we hand it over to our keynote conversation, I did want to say a few words on behalf of the Center for Women. So again, I'm Chanel Craft Tanner, the Assistant Director at the Center for Women. And in addition to this being the Jessica Glasser Lecture, this is also our Women's History Month keynote this year. So as you all know, March is Women's History Month, and we've had an amazing set of events. And we have the calendar out there if any of you want to take in and see the next few events that are coming up. But we, um, we really have had an amazing time this year putting this um, Women's History Month calendar together. So that's one of the things that the Center for Women does is that we host it. And we, um, as the students were developing what the Jessica Glasser lecture would look like, we thought that it would be a really good opportunity for us to like fuse that energy together. And so on the Center for Women's side, I do want to thank Tiffany Del Valle, who's a program coordinator there, who is my right hand girl. Um, and so none of this would have been possible without her and Danielle Steele, who's the interim director. Um, and so under her vision, we've been able to get a lot of things done. And of course, our student workers, who I don't know, I'm not going to call them out because I know some of them aren't here. But you all know who you are, and they put a lot of energy into what we do. So a little bit about tonight's um, keynote, Birthing Justice, Reproduction, Policing, and the Making of Freedom. You know, as I was thinking about the things that you all as students have been facing this week, I thought like, wow, we couldn't have picked a more perfect time in Emory's history to have these three women here to, to lead this conversation. So I really do hope that you all take away what it is you need to get through the types of activism and stuff that you're thinking about. So in addition to this being about reproductive justice and being about the anti-policing movement or the anti-police brutality movement, this is also just about how do you birth a movement in general? How do you build movements that are sustaining and that can grow and that can be reproduced? Um, and so I hope that you're able to pull those things away from this. If you are following along on Twitter, we ask you to use the hashtag birthing justice so that we can read through those tweets later and archive them and maybe pull them out and highlight them and do something cool with them later. Um, and so at this time, I'll introduce our moderator, who's Dr. Whitney Peoples. She's an Emory alum with a PhD from the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas at Arlington. And she does work around um, reproductive justice. And right now, her work is on reproduction in film, the, the reproductive politics in film, something like that. Film in black film in particular. So she had, so when the students said, we want to talk about, you know, we want someone who can speak to the Ferguson movement and someone who can speak to reproductive justice. That's the conversation we want. I was like, okay, 
we're going to have to have a really skillful moderator <laughs> who can bring those things together. And I knew Whitney would be the perfect person for that. Um, and so I hope that you enjoy, <laughs> enjoy what they have to say today. And thank you. Well, good evening. Can you all hear me? Do I need? All right. I'm pretty loud. So, okay. Very good. Um, my name is the Chanel noted already. I'm Dr. Whitney Peoples and I'm a provost postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas Arlington and uh, proudly a 2014 alum of the Women's and Gender Studies program uh, here, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, excuse me, here at Emory University. Um, I want to take a moment, I know we've already thanked these folks, but I want to thank them again because I think this is amazing that we are here. So I want to thank Tia Williams and I want to thank Chanel Craft Tanner for the work that they did to get us here, literally and figuratively to get us here to this table. I also want to thank the amazing students. I got a chance to meet some students over the past day or so that I've been here, and I'm telling you, these undergrads are fly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like, my God, like, I thought I was doing it as an undergrad, and these <laughs> women, you all would have run rings around me if we had been in school together, and I don't say that lightly. I don't like to admit that, so don't tweet that. Don't tweet that. Okay. Um, so I'll be your moderator tonight for, I think, what really promises to be an awesome exchange between these two women um, but before we get started, I want to take a few minutes to tell you how we're going to do things tonight and to talk a little bit about the theme, these three things that we'll be discussing. So I'm going to do this introduction. I'm going to introduce our guests. I'm going to turn it over to Monica and Janetta to give you a little bit of background in their own words about what they do and the work that they're doing. And then we will have the moderated discussion. We'll dedicate, I think, about 25 to 30 minutes to that discussion mm -hmm. because we want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. I think that's where the power in tonight will lie is in all of us being able to have a collective conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to moderate that Q&A, so get your questions together. Mm -hmm. If you have a real long, drawn-out, winding, like five-paragraph question, mm -hmm. I'm going to shut it down because that's what I do <laughs> as the moderator, okay? <laughs> so you can be angry with me about it, but, but work on those questions as we... <laughs> as we talk and we listen tonight. Um, so as I was preparing for tonight, I was trying to think about what for me signaled the important connection between reproduction, policing, and freedom. Mm -hmm. And what struck me was a powerful quote from a feminist poet whose work and life, I think many of us, certainly I, admire and respect. Um, in 1980, black lesbian feminist mother warrior poet, <laughs> as she called herself, yes. Audrey Lord wrote, yes, she did. some problems we share is women, mm -hmm. some we do not. Mm -hmm. You fear your children will grow up to join the patriarchy and mm -hmm. testify against you. Mm -hmm. We fear our children will be dragged from a car and shot down in the street, and you will turn your backs mm -hmm. upon the reasons they are dying. Mm -hmm. She wrote those words over 30 years before the murders of Trayvon Martin yes. in 2012, mm -hmm. Michael Brown in 2014, mm -hmm. and Sandra Bland in 2015. I would like to say that Lord was prescient in her foreshadowing mm -hmm. of the fate of black girls and boys, black men and women, some 30 years in the future. And she was prescient about a great many things. But this quote is not about foresight, because having been born and raised in the United States of America, Audrey Lord knew all too well the realities of violent racism and white supremacy. By the time she wrote those words in 1980, she had lived through the collective mourning of someone like an Emmett Till and too many others to name. She wasn't psychic, she was experienced. Mm -hmm. Experienced in the grief and terror of living black mm -hmm. under violent racism, under sexism, and under heterosexism. Yet she was prescient in her insistence on understanding the links between women, reproduction, and racist violence against black communities. Her quote alerts us, alerts us excuse me, not only to the physical violence visited upon black bodies, but to the psychological violence visited upon individual and collective black psyches. Mm. Through Lord, we understand that violence doesn't end with the murder and death of assaulted people. Rather, that those deaths sit on a continuum of violent assaults that impact the families, the loved ones, and the communities of the slaughtered. The rippling impact of anti-black violence in the form of mourning, daily fear and hourly concern for yourself, for those around you, is what brings us to reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. How can black families and communities broadly conceive, survive, and thrive under this kind of physical and psychic assault? And more importantly, why should they have to? 
Tonight, we are privileged to explore these questions and connections in conversation with two women who are working on the front lines of contemporary movements for freedom and justice, Janetta Elsie and Monica Ray Simpson. So I'm excited to be here with y'all, no question. <laughs> Monica Ray Simpson is the executive director of Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. A native of rural North Carolina, Monica has organized extensively against human rights violations, reproductive depression, the prison industrial complex, racism and intolerance, and is deeply invested in Southern movement building for the, in the fight for black liberation. She is also committed to birth justice as a certified doula. Yes. <laughs> Monica couples her activism with her artistry and has released her first live album entitled Revolutionary Love, blending her gospel and soul roots and her passion for social justice. Because of her activism, Monica was named as a new civil rights leader by Essence Magazine and chosen as one of Advocate Magazine's 40 Under 40 Leaders. Janetta Elzey is 26 years old. Ooh, I just put it all out there, but you sent it to me. <laughs> you can get me later. I thought it would be 26. Okay, good. You should be. I like it. And a protester and organizer born in St. Louis known for documenting the events of Ferguson on Twitter in August 2014. Yes. Since then, Janetta has worked to organize, to organize towards sustainable change. She sits on the planning team for MappingPoliceViolence.org and in August 2015 helped to launch Campaign Zero, a comprehensive policy platform to address police violence. Mm -hmm. Her work as an activist has been profiled in Teen Vogue, New York Times Magazine, the LA Times, and O Magazine, among others. Essence featured Janetta, and I mean featured Janetta, on the cover of February, the February 2016 Black Girl Magic issue. All right, just, just tore it up on that cover. She has been awarded the Howard Zinn Freedom to Write Award with fellow activist D. Ray McKesson for their creation of the hashtag Ferguson Protester newsletter. Thank you to both Janetta and Monica for being here today, and I'm going to turn you all over to them. Monica, if you'd like to go first. Sure. All right. Um, and then we'll get to our discussion. Awesome. I um, I love this because we're like 10 years apart. I'm, I'm like digging that so much. Um, and um, I'm just really, really blessed to be a part of this discussion tonight. So I thought a way to, you know, to kind of start to root, my, root you all in kind of like how I do what I do and what this work of reproductive justice is for me, I thought I would kind of start by giving you a little bit of my journey. Y'all all right with that? I really want this to be a conversation, so I don't want to feel like I'm giving you a presentation, all right? <laughs> um, so I did grow up in this very small rural town in North Carolina, literally one stoplight um, in my hometown. Like our McDonald's and our gas station were like connected to each other. Like it was like that small. Um, and so everything for me was really rooted in the black church, and that's where my organizing roots started. That's where I learned how to you know, use my voice. It's how I learned what oppression looked like because I was asking questions like why weren't women allowed to stand on the pulpit and why weren't we talking about our choir director who died very suddenly and everyone kept saying, well, he just had pneumonia really bad but not talking about HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And we weren't talking about how every young woman that I went to church with outside of about three or four of us were pregnant before they graduated high school and nobody was talking about sex. Right? So I took all of this with me when I decided to go to an HBCU against my mother's um, wishes. She didn't think I was going to be able to get a good job after going to an HBCU. But um, I grew up, you know, watching, you know, a different world in school days. And I was determined to, you know, have that experience for myself, right? Um, and I was determined to kind of have that type of activist life that I saw portrayed on these shows. Like, that's just what everything was for me. We didn't have the library. I didn't start off with the Bell Hooks and the Audrey Lords. This, I, my lived experience was really around what I had access to, which was church, TV, radio. That was it. And so going to school, I came out while I was in school. I thought that was going to be this big, you know, fun time for me. It wasn't. I realized that oppression is still very much real, um, even when we feel like we're in a space like an HBCU and everyone's going to be like down for what you do. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and so we started to organize because as when we came out, now this was 1999, right? So 
let's just think about the times. 1999, it wasn't very cool to be gay on campus. Um, and it wasn't very cool to like really talk about body and sexuality and gender and all of that. So there was a lot of violence that was happening on our black college campus at the time. And so that's what started me to do student organizing and to really get me invested in social justice movements. But also during that time, I had a friend that came to me because she saw what I was going through around my struggle of my own identity. Um, and she was also struggling with, a, a very, with an issue of her own. And she told me that she was pregnant. And she didn't want to be pregnant. She was the first child out of her family to go to college. She really wanted to be able to make her own decisions about what her life path was. So she didn't want to have this child. And so I asked her what she wanted to do. She said she wanted to have an abortion. Now, up, and up, up until that point, I hadn't really even thought about abortion. Like, for us, abortion was for white women. That's not something that we ever thought about in my small rural town, in my small black church. But I told this woman, and now a very dear friend of mine, of course, that if this is what you feel like you need to do for yourself, and I'm going to support you through that process. And so I took her to our local clinic for her to have her abortion. And I remember seeing those protesters, and I remember seeing um, all those folks, all those signs, and all of this really just vivid, ridiculous imagery, just trying to walk into the building to do something that you needed to do for yourself. And I knew at that point that my work had to very much be centered at the intersections of all of my life. There's no way I could like check out the fact that I was a black woman living in the US. I could not check out the fact that I was a queer woman. I could not check off the fact that me as woman and me needing to make my own decisions around my reproductive life, all of these things were central to me. And so um, journeying through the different movements that I did, just kind of working through the LGBTQ movement, doing stuff around the prison industrial complex and working to abolish for-profit private prisons, I saw where all of these things came to a head because I was seeing women behind bars with babies in immigrant detention centers. And I'm like, this is bigger than just a criminal justice issue, right? <laughs> this is something bigger. And that's what brought me into, um, I remember it was like 2005, I think it was, I came to Atlanta for the US, uh, for the um, social forum. How many folks remember that? Y'all old enough for that? Some folks in the room, right? Right? From the social forum that happened. Um, so I came to the social forum and I went to this workshop there. It was led by Loretta Ross, who was then the national coordinator for Sister Song. And she brought up this term reproductive justice. And I was like, well, well what is that? Right? I, I heard of reproductive health, reproductive rights, but I had never heard of reproductive justice. And going through that training with her, she helped me to understand that it was rooted in black feminist theory, but it was rooted in human rights. And they weren't just talking about the right to not have a child, but they were also talking about the human right to have children in the ways that you want to have them, and the human right to parent our children in healthy and sustainable environments. And I'm like, whoa, where has this movement been my entire life? I didn't know anything about this. So they kind of stayed on my periphery for a couple of years, and as the universe would have it, I had an opportunity to move to Atlanta from North Carolina to take on a position at Sister Song, which then landed me now in this executive director role. So I wanted to give you all this kind of journey, because when we do, when we talk about reproductive justice, again, it's this, it's this intersectional framework, and it gives us an opportunity to talk about how all the different layers of oppression, all the different intersections, intersections of our identities are at play all the time in our lives. And it wasn't until coming into this movement in particular that I, I felt like I didn't have to check any identity at the door. Like I didn't have to, you know, when I was doing LGBTQ work, y'all, at some point, you know, they weren't trying to talk about my black side. That just was not it, right? Or when I was doing work around like prison industrial complex and, you know, private prisons and things like that, they weren't really talking about queer issues at the time and how very much we needed to include, you know, that in the, in the conversation, but the, it just wasn't happening. And so this movement that was created by black women in 1994, because they saw the need for us to address how our reproductive lives and social justice issues come together, I knew I had found home. I knew I'd found my organizing home, my movement home, and I'll stop there because I know we have so much more to talk through. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> How did you follow that? Girl, please. <laughs> um, can we do like an intro to who we are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just a little. <coughs> All right. Want us to do? Uh, yeah. So, beginners, I'm an introvert. I hate speaking in public. <laughs> I literally could crawl out <laughs> of my skin. So in January 2014, um, 2014 was like the most transformational year of my life. Um, my mother passed away January 31st um, from lupus. 
In February 2014, St. Louis City Police killed one of my really close friends, Stefan, and did not tell his mother why. The detectives did not interview witnesses, um, and they still have not answered her phone calls to understand why they killed her only child. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so, because my mother had just passed, I didn't have, like, the capacity didn't even know that capacity was a word for me to say that I don't have the capacity. Um, I was depressed, so I couldn't like mourn the loss of my friend while trying to mourn my mother. Um, so from February to July, I was depressed, like just the whole time, and smiling the whole way. Um, and finally in July, I kind of just, I don't know if I snapped out of it because I still have moments and that's fine. Um, but I realized that my sister was about to start high school and she didn't have a mother. But I did when I was 15 and 14 going to this all white school. My sister didn't have that. So I snapped out of it. It was like, it's time for me to go put on my big girl pants and be a sister to Tootie. <laughs> and we gonna be all right. So July, August, we're good. Like 30 days of black girl fun. You know, mm -hmm. we in the sun, we going to the pool, we want the band, what you want to do, we want to take you to the mall, great. August 9th, um, oh, first, a milestone, Boosie was released from jail. Yes. Free Boosie. Free Boosie. Loose as a boost. Come on. Get it started. about my Instagram, my Twitter, my Facebook, my Tumblr, my YouTube, everything changes. Like I don't talk about as nearly as much fun shit as I would love to talk about. I talk about what I do now. Yeah. So August 9th, my ground is killed and this woman named April who lives in Mississippi who I followed since 2009 when I first made my Twitter, she tweets me and was like, Netta, I think the police just killed some boy. His body is still in the street, though. Mm. And it's in St. Louis. Mm. I was like, April, stop lying. Mm. Not stop lying that the police didn't kill someone, because I fully believe that the police would kill anybody black in St. Louis, and that would be a thing. Um, but I could not believe that his body was still in the ground four and a half hours later. Um, or I couldn't believe when I like searched my Twitter and I saw his mother not able to go see him and I'm seeing her reaction in real time while I'm out in the suburbs in my house cold and comfy mm -hmm. and this woman is out here on the streets sweaty hot confused mad angry um, enraged all these things so I text my best friend and we decided we were going to go, but we had to wait till she could stop work. So we went at 9 o'clock. Um, I spent most of the day on Twitter looking for news, if there was news. Mm -hmm. And when there was news, it was wrong. Mm -hmm. So we've seen Trayvon, we've seen Jordan Davis, we've seen all these stories happen all the time. And I've seen lie after lie after lie. Um, and somehow the victim becomes the aggressor. And because they're black, they're automatically, you might as well just say that like they killed themselves. The white person just couldn't control themselves. Um, and I just knew that this was going to be different. I know where I'm from. I know black people where I'm from. Whitney is from where I'm from. <laughs> like, it's no joke. Like St. Louis people do not play. So I was just like, this is gonna be like some shit. So let me put on my tennis shoes and not these flats that I have on. <laughs> um, and so we went down there, it was like 9.30, 9 o'clock at night, and I just started tweeting the stuff that I was hearing. Um, I heard little three-year-olds say they saw Mike Mike get killed. I 
met this black nurse who said she wanted to go up to him and she felt that he was still alive. Um, and the police like pulled this, what we now know are M16, but they pulled out this gun and they pointed at her and told her to get the fuck back. Mm -hmm. And then I saw his blood. And I remember on Twitter, they were trying to like wash his blood away with soap and water, but it was still there. Mm -hmm. So it was like underneath the street light and um, it was like really vibrant. And it was almost like his body was still there. Mm -hmm. And I don't talk about the beginning because it's so like, mm -hmm. it's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my first day in the movement. Mm -hmm. The next day was my first protest. My best friend and I go to the Ferguson PD, blue socks, um, nothing but white police officers and angry black people. Um, and that was just really wild to me. Like I felt like I was in the 1950s or something. And my grandparents and my family were so mad that we went back. Mm -hmm. um, and so my grandmother is calling the whole time, like yelling, a Christian Southern black woman, mm -hmm. mad mm -hmm. that her baby is down there with them people. And um, I'm just like, I'm not leaving. So that was like our first two days. After that, we were under police and military occupation for 21 days, and we fought back the whole time. I've been tear gassed 11 times. I've been shot with a rubber bullet once. I've been arrested. <laughs> I, um, gosh. There's so much happened in the first three weeks. And since then, like, you know, all of the re name recognition has happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those first three weeks, we didn't even know if we would make it home at night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I also want to mention, since we're talking about reproductive justice, that tear gas is an abortion agent. Mm -hmm. And I now have four or five black women friends who have had multiple miscarriages mm -hmm. since August 2014. Mm -hmm. So I'm 26 and I want to have babies one day mm -hmm. and I don't know if I can because I've been tear gassed so many damn times. Mm -hmm. um, so just like we think about so many parts of what has happened to us in Ferguson and how it'll have like lifelong effects besides like just the basic trauma or the fact that I like hear a police siren and I like flinch or like yesterday I'm coming through the airport and I didn't realize that um, it was heightened security, and so like okay. the police are just walking around with their huge guns, yes. and I was like, I'm not ready for this. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't expect to get off the plane and see this shit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I actually wrote shit down, sorry. <laughs> um, so apart, after the first 21 days, I met DeRay, I met Brittany Packnett, I met our friend Justin Hanford. We started the Ferguson Protester Newsletter. Um, it started with about 200 people, got to about 20,000 people before mm -hmm. we just started tweeting the news. Cause it just took so much to do that newsletter. We also did mappingpoliceviolence.org with our friend Sam, who is a black data scientist. And um, for the people who are like, well, y'all just making this up. What about black on black crime? Let's talk about this. Mapping Police Violence provided data and numbers for all the people who wanted facts yeah. mm -hmm. so when you throw facts in the face they still you know depending mm -hmm. on who you're talking to they might be like well that's not enough right um and with mappingpoliceviolence.org we also disproved that black on black crime has nothing to do with police violence in black neighborhoods uh, the two are not connected mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. so that was very satisfying for me when my grandparents yeah. get started and i was like stop <laughs> like go read and then let's come back. <laughs> um, and then from there, we started Campaign Zero, which is a 10-point policy plan on ending police violence. And we say police violence because in the beginning, everyone kept ca calling it police brutality. And we were like, no. The only people we see being violent out here are the police. Mm -hmm. And the only people who get a pass for their violence are the police. When we react, then that's considered black rage, yeah. black whatever, mm -hmm. black anger, and that's like 
a commodity. Like the news couldn't get enough of it. But it was just like, why don't you talk about what we're reacting to? Mm -hmm. So I'm almost done. <laughs> um, with our platform with Campaign Zero, it's gotten us meetings with people like Valerie and Jarrett, Loretta Lynch, um, Bernie and Hillary, and. <laughs> of going into every space in every room where I feel like I don't belong and tell the truth is what happened to me and to my hometown and to black people in this country mm -hmm. and um, that's me. I love yes. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to start by uh, asking you all a question about home. Um, I'm struck by the way that you both talked about starting quite literally at home and in home spaces, mm -hmm. so in your home city, in your home church, and being radicalized on home ground. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think when we think about what it, what it is to be radicalized, and we, we have to go out into the world mm -hmm. and do this elsewhere and bring it back to where we're from, mm -hmm. but that's not what you all are describing. You're describing your home spaces as being violated um, or mm -hmm. perhaps unsafe and also in some ways supportive of your transformation and your growth as activists. So I want to ask a little bit about that, about the significance of home in your work and in how you come to it and how you do it. Mm. Okay, I, you know, I, for me, I answer that question with like, for me, I think it was necessary for my growth and development as an activist to, um, to understand my community and understand how to um, work within my community, how to work with different types of people um, on, a, on in a place that was um, familiar mm -hmm. to me, right? And so I think it strengthened my skills um, that then helped me once I was kind of removed from that place and like going outside of, you know, this small rural town or my black church, I was able to then use those skills. So I see that I see home was like a, it was like a training ground okay. um, for me. Um, and a safer training ground, right? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, so for me, I'm, I'm grateful that my I was activated in a space that was familiar to me, which allowed me to, I think, kind of push the box a little bit in ways that I may not have done if I was activated as an activist outside mm -hmm. of um, outside of my home space. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I can say the challenge with that, though, right? Because my, I, we were so limited in um, this small rural town. Again, like we didn't have, you know, access to some of, some of the great information I've now had access to over my now 36 years. But, you know, growing up, it was just, we had such limited information. Mm -hmm. So um, you had to be really creative and very savvy and like, you know, to really understand how to like make change happen there because you weren't able to pull from any different resources because everything, again, it was just so limited. So that was a challenge to that. But the strength, I think, is it allowed me a safer space to be able to build my skills mm -hmm. to then use as I journeyed outside of that space. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about the way I was raised, that makes me remember why maybe I've <laughs> gone the path that I have. Uh, my mother was a dark-skinned black woman, and she took nobody's shit. Um, she, yes. <laughs> and she pretty much raised me to be the exact same way. Um, I was her firstborn. She let me know all the time that the world would not be easy off to me um, and that I needed to be a leader at all times because I have a 15-year-old sister and she would tell me all the time I won't be here forever. Um, so I learned how to fight for myself really early, especially going to all white schools. I had to fight white people all the time, not even physically, but just get your hands off me, get your hands out my hair, don't touch me, <laughs> stop talking to me. I'm not here to educate you, I'm here to get my own education. Um, and even when I was doing this, my mother would come and tell the teachers and principals and whoever else, parents, everything, leave my child alone. Um, and I think that that was really important because now I have to tell people that all the time, leave me alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a part of home is my family, so like my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my aunt, those are other women, black women, who are I learned a lot from. 
Um, I act a lot like my grandmother, which really annoys me. <laughs> Own it. Um, right. I'm yeah. definitely yeah. um, my, great, my grandmother's grandchild. Um, but it's just all these women that I bring like all this strength from. And my grandpa, I think the characteristic I got from him is being quiet. Mm -hmm. I, let a, I let people talk so I can, you know, decipher if I care to listen any further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and people will always tell on themselves when they talk to us. So they, <laughs> every um, and that's another skill that's been real useful in the mm -hmm. movement. Everybody tells on themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I think about my friends. My friends are, well, you know, the, the cliche statements where you say your friends are the people, your family you choose. And they really are. I was lucky that um, all of my friends protested with me yeah. in the very beginning. I didn't have to find or search for people to go, or I didn't have to be a stranger. We all knew that we had to go. Mm -hmm. We all had to fight our families and tell them we're grown mm -hmm. um, and we're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it makes me feel like I watch Underground, and last week's episode where Noah asked Rosalie to run with him mm -hmm. really just touched me. But um, <laughs> basically, that's what I asked my friends. Like, where I'm mm -hmm. going, are we all going? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, do I have yeah. to find some other friends who are going? And um, so that's just it. Like, the way I was raised with around and with white people and being the token, um, my mother shielding me all the time and creating all this space for me to be a carefree black girl. And then my friends. Yeah. yeah, I love this. I hear um, in both of these a kind of conversation about your own organic leadership, your own mm -hmm. organic approach to how you will do the work that mm -hmm. you're doing, where you got that from, your mama, your grandmama, right, Absolutely. your friends. Um, and I think that's important. I think that's important for, for black folks and for black women that our leadership models often are organic and they yes. are often coming from we give expertise to spaces and to people that mm -hmm. perhaps otherwise wouldn't be recognized in that way. I'm wondering how that... Um, what happens when, when your approach is to sort of leadership and the way that you engage the work that you do, when that butts up against media notions of leadership, mm. right? So I'm thinking, um, you know, reproductive justice and the work that you all are both doing, anti-black police violence, these are very diffuse movements, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they are not that traditional top-down leadership mm -hmm. model. But I, I wonder how you all respond to and how you work around an insistence on where are the leaders? Where are the leaders? Are you the leader? Are you the leader? Right, you know, and mm -hmm. define the issues for us as the leader that we've appointed you to be, right? Mm -hmm. How do you all negotiate that? How do you mm -hmm. negotiate that with yourselves, but also with your allies, with your friends, and with your, your fellow organizers? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Uh, <laughs> I push back a lot. I push back almost in every space that I am. Mm -hmm or with every person that I've talked to because they have in their mind what they want me to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm right here like, I'm not that. <laughs> um, and I try to be as honest as possible by telling people whatever you have in your mind about what I should be or who I am, like, delete it. Mm -hmm. um, so the media, mm, I think we've established some ground rules by, by now. It's almost been <laughs> 18, 19 months. And in the beginning, it was lots of fighting, like, I will not be doing this. You will not have me over here. I did not say that. Mm -hmm. Misquote me again. I won't talk to your journalist anymore, blah, right. blah. And then I just stopped doing interviews for, like, a while. And it was great. Um, mm -hmm. And that's fine. People don't know how to accept that I am okay with not being visible on the news yeah. all day. Or that we have talked about whose roles Who's, whose role is what, and what are you best at? And I am not the best to go send out to go talk to Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> Ray is totally the person to talk to Wolf Blitzer. He's like a professional code switcher. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I will call somebody a motherfucker in a heartbeat and not think anything <laughs> twice yes. about it. Yeah. And That's Wolf really Blitzer would have got absolutely everything coming to him. <laughs> um, I wish, though, I would have seen that. I'm just... That's, see, that's the problem. I do wish maybe that would have happened. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> he gets these 140 characters, though. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, but, yeah, it's just, like, I don't negotiate when it comes to my comfortableness. Yeah. Like, what makes me comfortable. And that's it. Yeah. 
You know, for us um, in this reproductive justice movement, which has become like this phrase that folks are like talking about now, like yes. people were not talking about reproductive justice a couple of years ago, and this movement was birthed in 1994, so it's like 20 years old. And a lot of people did not know that it was birthed by these black women who came together, right? <laughs> you know, at the height of healthcare reform during the Clinton administration, when we first started having these conversations about healthcare reform in this country, and black women were already on the cutting edge of understanding that in that conversation that certain communities were going to get left out of that. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to ensure that we did not and that this conversation centered the most marginalized and the communities that they were working with. And so they, you know, just their acts of just like bravery at that time and their voice, their expertise at that time really shifted the narrative. But when thinking about like leadership, they were still very silent in this larger world of reproductive health and rights, which was very much led by white women, large main white, white organizations, mainstream organizations. Um, and so they, we were always under the radar on these issues. So whenever someone was talking about um, bodily autonomy issues or abortion even, um, it was, you know, the response was always coming from white women, white feminists, right? Um, and so whenever the attacks, just to use an example, when the attacks on like abortion in particular became very racialized, like even in 2010, and I'm not sure how many folks were here in Atlanta in 2010, when the billboard campaign came here, right, the red, the most dangerous place for an African American child is in the mother's womb, right? Billboards, blatant, started here in Atlanta and then spread across the country with little black babies' faces on it, shaming black women for their reproductive decision making. And not only shaming black women, but also using this, this um, topic of abortion as a wedge issue for black people to pit us against each other, right? Um, making this a very high morally charged issue. And so again, when black women started to raise their voices and then when even Sister Song created the Trust Black Women Partnership because of that attack, right, um, on our reproductive freedom. People were like, oh, black women are talking about abortion? Black, like, black women are talking about <laughs> sex and bodies? Like, this was something that we have not been doing since the beginning of time, but it's just like, when we think about the media and who has the microphone, and that's one thing I actually um, am so grateful for with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, not only did they raise awareness around an issue that was necessary, right, and not only did they do the direct action that was necessary, they also helped to shift the narrative and they have they, they actually help to yes. make it possible for more people of color, more black people in particular, to actually get the microphone to talk and to show that we have an analysis and an expertise around these issues too. So that that trickled down into other movements, including the reproductive justice movement. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we again it's just something we've always had to buck against this um, very mainstream, very white feminist. Um, world when doing reproductive justice and hold on to the principles and what reproductive justice is yeah. as a movement birthed by black women so it is not co-opted and then created to be something that was not created by black women because it was, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so it has definitely been a, a, a battle and a dance with that. And I think that, you know, our first way of kind of a, a, attacking that, right? Um, so Planned Parenthood in 2014 was, you know, in the New York Times talking about working from this more expanded analysis of how they do their work. And we're, I mean, we understand, we understand Planned Parenthood for what it is. And this is no diss to Planned Parenthood because I believe that they are definitely helping communities with their services. But they like totally like negated all all of the work that women of color yes. have been doing for over 20 years. And so, you know, we wrote this open letter and I, I was like, Cecile, we're getting ready to sit down. We're not getting ready to do this anymore, right? Yeah. And so it's like, again, like how you have to set your boundaries and how you have to like assert yourself, you know, in this work. It's, we're just at that point. And now we have this opening where we got to keep going through that opening and keep just plummeting like, no, 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 you can't. We're shifting all of it. Like we're changing the whole narrative. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely been a battle. Yeah, it's definitely tiring. Been a battle. Yes, it is very tiring. <laughs> yes, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to do your work and then you have to deal with these allies and the problematic ones and the good ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have to always have to buck up against that and it is very tiring. Yeah. Yeah. I had a student tell me a, a few weeks ago she described Planned Parenthood as a reproductive justice organization. Oh. And I was taken aback. I was absolutely oh, taken aback. Really? And she said, it's That's not. And I said, no. Well, maybe it is now. I mean, maybe I'm, you know, but I said, no, traditionally that's not the framework. Um, no. and, and she didn't know, she had no clue about mm -hmm. the history of the term. And so mm -hmm. that's the, the way these terms and these movements and notions of leadership mm -hmm. get co-opted, I think yeah. is, um, it's an important part of the politics. Yeah. yeah. 
No, no, that's the I down there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, something else you want to add to that? Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to work on it. I'm going to keep working mm-hmm. on it. Um, so I want to ask um, about, I'm going to switch gears, but not, mm-hmm. not, not a lot. You just talked about the sort of centrality of, of black women to, mm-hmm. to this work, to the work that you all, I believe, both are doing. Um, mm-hmm the way that black women have really shifted and transformed the narrative across multiple spaces Absolutely. when it comes to thinking about freedom, right? When it comes to thinking about what it means for black folks to feel safe, to feel whole in the spaces where they live. Um, but one of, I think, the, the critiques that's come out of some of the work that we're seeing now around anti-black police violence mm-hmm. is the silence around particular forms of violence that black women are dealing with, mm-hmm. right? So I'm thinking uh, most specifically, I think a lot about Daniel Holt's law, right? Mm-hmm. And the, tri- the trial in Oklahoma um, mm-hmm. and the heinous acts mm-hmm. that he was accused of and has now been convicted of some, but not all mm-hmm. um, of them. And you know the way that some folks have said that they had to fight to get people mm-hmm. to be interested in this, to take it up as a cause of police violence. Um, and, and to want to go down and, and essentially rep for these women, right? right. Um, and so I'm, I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that, on mm-hmm. what do you think is, do you think that that's a fair critique? Um, and if it is, you know, what's the hole in the framework that leaves mm-hmm. this, these kinds of acts of violence invisible? And if it isn't a fair critique, a little bit more about why you think it isn't one. Mm. That's a lot. If Daniel had raped... Like 21 or yeah. something like that. 20 something women. If he had raped 20 white women, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. would he have even made it to 20? Mm-hmm. And yeah. like what people have already believed in the moment they said Absolutely. he raped yeah. them. Um, so that's a part. Black people, black women in particular, are just not humanized the way that white women are or mm-hmm. any other race. Um, it's trash, mm-hmm. but that's like our lived experience. I know that black women love and support me in a way that I don't experience that from pretty much anybody else in our community. Mm -hmm. Like I have individuals that I can call on, like individual black men who I can say are not harmful or problematic, Mm -hmm. or there are individual um, elders that I can call on. Walk for them, but it's like black. It's something about like this covenant that exists between black women that we know we have to form, that we know we have to protect, that we know we have to cultivate and fill with love. Like we know we have to do this because the world won't do it for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do does the movement show up for black women and black girls and black trans women the way that it should? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. And I would be like such a liar if I said that, oh no, the movement as a whole, it really does. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it really fucking doesn't. Like yeah. I could mm-hmm. post, I post things about Sandra, mm-hmm. like the latest updates. I mm-hmm. always find the latest because I love her mother. I love her sister. Mm-hmm. Um, and nothing. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a few retweets or I'll check the engagements. Maybe like a couple thousand people look. Mm-hmm. But if it's like a latest, the police killed, said young black boy, young black man, it's Mm -hmm. instant. Mm -hmm. So that's like a lived experience knowing that I'm a black woman. Do I feel like people would be upset if the police ever harmed me because I'm so visible? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But what what about my friends who the public doesn't know? Or I can't make a connection for white people to see this person was also a person. You should care about her. Mm-hmm. Or to black men, this person could have been your sister. You should mm-hmm. care about her. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, this system of uh, patriarchy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Say it again, Monica. Say it again. It is, <laughs> it is a bitch, y'all. Yeah. Like, it just is. Yeah. I mean, there's no, I can't even say it articulately or like academically. It's a bitch, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think that we have to own that. Like, we have to talk about that just as much as we talk about white supremacy and racism. Um, And I don't think that we do. Mm -hmm. I think that we um, put a lot of our weight and a lot of our energy, a lot of our resources into trying to dismantle these systems of uh, this white supremacy racism, which we should. And we don't do very well at, you know, 
parsing stuff out to actually attack multiple things at the same time, right? Um, and I think that's why they're not showing up for Daniel Holt's Claw's case. That's why they didn't show up for Marissa Alexander, you know, in Florida. That's why, you know, we keep seeing these things. That's why they're not showing up for Sandra Bland in the same way. That hurts my feelings. I do the same thing, sis. Like, I'm always trying to put out stuff about, like, the latest updates on Sandra Bland because I believe that was the, I mean, I wrote a song about it. Like, it, it, was, the, it was something about her in particular, and I know it's because she's a black woman. I saw her as sister. Friend. Like, I, I don't understand why we do not have as much energy behind her mm -hmm. and finding justice for her in the ways that we have done for the other brothers and young brothers that we've lost. I do not, I mean, I do understand, but it, 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 it makes me very, very upset mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all the time. Um, so I think that we have to address that system. We have to be willing to have those conversations and we have to be willing, we gotta find those brothers, right? Um, Cause we got some brothers that get it. We have to have them start to talk about what patriarchy looks like too, mm -hmm. right? Because we, because so we talk all the time about like white allies, right? And it's like, oh, we got to get other white allies. Get your people. Talk to your people. All right, brothers, get your brothers, right? Yeah. How about you start talking to your brothers about this stuff and like really doing that for real, for real? Not just you know getting the mic and talking about patriarchy, but are you, are you really like going there with your brothers? Mm -hmm. I don't see them doing that. Mm -hmm. And until they do that, it is not. Black women have been holding this for a very long time. Yeah. We, oh, we've been holding it for, from movement to movement to movement. And we tired, right? It's time for them to pick, and we've been doing it for them. Yeah. So it's time for them to pick their shit up, right? And start to get their brothers in line, get their brothers in formation. Be, we can be in formation with Beyonce all day long. Can we make one for the brothers? Yes, who makes t-shirts? Hashtag brother get in formation. <laughs> Seriously. Brother get in formation. We can yes. get it, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. We got to. We yeah. have to. Our lives depend on it. That's the thing, right? Yeah. Um, our lives depend on it. It just does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just ask a couple more questions, and then I will open it up for questions But um, from you all. But I think one of the things that I'm interested in, so in just a little bit of time that, that we've gotten a chance to talk, mm. I feel like what I what I loved, what I heard over and over again when we talked yesterday was sometimes you just got to form your own shit. Sometimes mm -hmm. you just got to walk away and create what you need, Absolutely. right? Um, and that might mean leaving whatever resources were in the old space. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but you got to be ready to walk away and you got to be ready to form what's new. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, say her name mm -hmm. um, as, as as a hashtag, but also as a movement. Right, um, and the work that Kimberly Crenshaw is doing through the African American Policy Forum, For sure. um, and so I'm thinking about. But again, you know, not I don't think being heard with the same amount of force, right? Mm -hmm. But I think she did, in fact, and, and not just Kimberly Crenshaw, but other folks that Crenshaw was working with did, in fact, pick up their things and say, "We're gonna go over here, and mm -hmm. we're gonna find some new resources, and we're gonna play." But and. I, I want to know a little bit more because I think both of the, the movements that you all work in mm -hmm. are also products of that, right? They're mm -hmm. not just responses, but they're products of walking away from frameworks mm -hmm. that weren't working, right? So from what we think of as traditional civil rights organizing, traditional reproductive rights mm -hmm. organizing, right? They, they weren't working. And so I, I'm asking you all to talk a little bit about what it means to, to get up with your bags, to pack mm -hmm. your things, take your money from under the mattress, mm -hmm. and walk away. <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. and create your own and find new resources. Mm -hmm. The the scary parts of that, the empowering parts of that. But how do you what's how do you do that work? Mm -hmm. What's the process of that? If you could talk a little bit about starting your own. Mm. Uh. <laughs> That's just a quick question. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's so um, quick. I just in the beginning um, in August, I would get invited into all these rooms because men couldn't ignore me. Black men couldn't ignore me. They could ignore all the other black women, but because I already had a social media presence before um, August 9th, I became like one of the trusted voices in Ferguson for people to follow and get information or learn where to drop shit off at, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have to fight to get into the room. But once I got to the table, black men would ask other black men questions and then eventually they'd be like, oh, maybe we should ask her a question. Um, and it literally only took me one time to be in some meeting at Webster, or where was I, Jesus? Uh, Washington University. And I was just like, I'm done with this. Like, I'm hot. I haven't eaten. I haven't sleeping. <laughs> I haven't slept. Um, I don't have time. 
to being here with y'all. I don't know what you're in here doing. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're solving white supremacy, this ain't it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and y'all ain't even the people to be doing that work, so I'm out. And um, I just went back to the streets, and I was just like, that ain't it, I'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And that's really just the spirit of it, like, I will figure this shit out. When I don't have money to pay my bills, I will figure this out. Um, when I need to eat, I will figure this out. Like, I came from a woman who was the queen of figuring some shit out. So she uh, knew that she wasn't going to work a traditional nine to five. My mom start, opened up a beauty salon. Um, so we had a, a small black business when I was growing up. So I've seen examples of you could just do it if you just put your mind to it, be real creative, and make it work, um, and have a plan. Now here, we didn't have that many plans, and my grandparents definitely didn't think we knew what the hell we were doing at all. Um, God, but we just put our minds together and <coughs> bounce ideas off of each other. When I met Dre and Brittany and Justin, that's really all we ever, that's all we did for the first month that we knew each other. It was just like, what are the things we all agree on that need to be fixed, that are right now problems? What are the things we can see in the future that could be fixed? And we'll still like stand the test of time because also looking to the past with what the civil rights movement passed and how all of the Mm -hmm. things that came out of that are being dismantled or taken Mm -hmm. away completely. Mm -hmm. So like how does whatever we do, how does it have standing power? Um, So that's really it. Like I just, if it makes me uncomfortable, if it makes me unhappy, if it gives me a headache, if I feel like it's not in alignment with my vision, I leave. Mm -hmm. And I'll just go do something else. That's critical. Yeah, that's critical. Um, that's critical and that's beautiful. <laughs> Let me just say that. So this reproductive justice movement that I came into now, you know, since moving, you know, what I love about this reproductive justice movement is that our founders, so to speak, the mothers of the RJ movement, as we call them, they're still with us. Yeah. Right, like all the 12 black women that came together in that room to create this framework um, in 94, they are all still with us. So we get to see them and interact with these women um, whenever we want to, because they're here. So I, 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 I'm, I'm happy about that, that makes me feel really great. Um, and then there's been like this big um, movement shift, right, where a lot of those women who started this work in 94 have kind of moved out of their leadership positions and now this new wave of leaders have now come into place. Um, New black women, I'm grateful to be one of them and there are many other black women who are leading amazing RJ organizations across this country. Um, And that was a serious intergenerational like shift, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and it wasn't beautiful, right? Like it was, you know, it makes me think about um, (laughs) our elders and how do we create safe space for them to also make the transitions that they need to make from their roles, but also make the space necessary for us to step into our leadership roles, right? So that was just a big kind of movement um, dynamic that we had to deal with within the movement as this new leadership was stepping up. And so, like you said, this movement of RJ was created because there wasn't a voice or a space that women of color, black women in particular, could occupy and lead from around reproductive health and rights um, in a way that really resonated with us and that really impacted our communities in the ways that we wanted to. Mm -hmm. So um, they said no to that framework and absolutely created their own. And we still live in that legacy, right? So for us, what what we've now, the, the movement was kind of started from this very womb-centered, very cisgendered woman. Um, it, it was created from that space, right? Mm-hmm. And many of the leaders who are leading reproductive justice organizations now are not straight women. They're not, you know, so it's like we've now had to now, like, basically kind of buck back at that and say, okay, reproductive justice is not just about women having babies, right? Because all many different types of people have babies. It's yeah. not just cisgendered women. Um, there are queer families now. What does that look like for us? And so we've had to, you know, really stretch this framework even further than where they stretched it to kind of create reproductive justice, yeah. um, which has also been 
quite movement, quite a movement like challenge, right? Um, and it's been a critique of the movement as well, right? So we, that's just something we've had to grapple with and understand. And so, yeah, we our foremothers said no, we said yes, and we said there's more. Yeah. Right. And so we continue to kind of step forward in that. And because we know that we're already standing in that legacy of women who said that it wasn't working for us. So this is what we have to do differently for us and to make sure that our communities have what they need. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. It's in some ways you all had a model yeah. right? that had been from the previous generation and you all were creating yeah. a totally new model. Right. But in both ways, really responding to. Mm -hmm previous generations, but also contemporary notions of who you were supposed to be and who Absolutely. your movements were supposed to be. Mm -hmm.